Hello everyone, uh, my name is Gaurav. Uh, I'm Matt. We are Gaurav and Matt and we will talk to you today about uh, our experience debugging a challenging issue in production for a customer. Uh, this customer is a major bank in Europe. They were migrating their risk analysis data warehouse from on-premises to cloud. What was really interesting about this data warehouse is that their SQL tests used to verify the correctness of data needed to be certified by regulatory authorities of the country. Hence, the customer had three ways of achieving this migration. The first one was to rewrite the SQL uh, application in the language of the new cloud data warehouse and rewrite the tests, certify the new tests, and then they could say they were done. This approach would have required significant time and resources. However, if the customer chose not to recertify the tests, they would have had to put some actual money to account for the risk that they introduced into the system. So the only realistic way of doing this migration was to use database virtualization. This, will allow, this would allow the customer to maintain their legacy application source code, maintain the legacy tests, even when they have moved on to the new platform. This project was due for completion. We were all happy, uh, everything was happy in our land until it wasn't. When the customer started running some specific jobs which exported large amounts of data uh, from the new cloud data warehouse, our system would crash. Uh, the, I think at this point, this was the largest amount of data we were trying to export from the system till that point. What was also the kicker is that we did not have direct access to the uh, customer instance of our product that was running. All we could do was deploy diagnostic builds and look at logs. The clock was ticking. The completion date was staring at us. We were running out of ideas to reproduce the issue. So we decided to test a bunch of hypotheses that we had. For each of these hypotheses, we wrote a bunch of SQL tests. Fortunately, what happened was a set of tests which forced the system to export large chunks of data uh, started showing a memory consumption pattern which was very similar to what we had seen at the customer's end. This was as close as we could get to the actual issue. What followed was a series of measurements and architectural changes to our product. But before we dive into them, we need to talk a little bit about the use case and our product called HyperQ. How many of you travel often between North America and the rest of the world? I know a bunch of you were on the Frankfurt to SFO flight this week. Uh, I travel often from US to India and every time I try to plug in something that I bought from US, especially a plug into the sockets back at home in India, in my parents' home. It's a really rickety socket at my parents' home. But it wouldn't work, and also vice versa. But we know the solution to this problem, right? You use an adapter. You put the adapter in the configuration of the wall socket, plug in your existing device, and it works. There is absolutely no need for ripping out the wiring, putting a new uh, system in place to use the new plug. Yet, this is what we do to database migrations now. This is the state of the art. Well, it used to be. Uh, the state of the art is to rewrite customer applications when you're moving from one database to the other. This sounds very much like rewriting, rewiring an application. An alternative to this approach is database virtualization. The virtualization provides a way for uh, the SQL applications to still move to the new data warehouse without having to rewrite the application logic. This can result in significant cost savings because of less effort uh, 
and less risk involved in the process. Let's talk about the product, HyperQ. Here is a simplified diagram of what HyperQ looks like. Uh, on the left, uh, well, HyperQ is an application written in Erlang. Uh, it sits in between the client SQL application and the target cloud data warehouse the customer wants to move to. This means that the uh, customer can continue running the legacy SQL queries, the ETL, and reporting jobs on the new platform because HyperQ makes this translation possible in real time. In this diagram, we can trace the journey of a query. On the left side uh, is a legacy query coming uh, into HyperQ. HyperQ ingests these queries and uh, sometimes data uh, along with the queries in the network protocol of the client. Then it translates the query into the outputs, output SQL dialect and sends it to the target cloud data warehouse on the right. The actual execution of the query is done on the, the cloud data warehouse. When it returns the result sets to HyperQ, HyperQ would convert them into the format and network protocol that the client expects and send it back. So for the client, it is as if the old database, for the client, it seems like uh, the old database is still there because it's sending the queries in the same uh, dialect, returning the results, uh, in the, getting back the results in the same format. But in the background, everything has changed and customers have moved to a new data warehouse. Now that we, uh, questions before we, if, if there are any burning questions before we move on. I am glad you're on board with this journey. Uh, now that you have a background of the problem we are solving and the product, let's look at the incident itself. Uh, when we were close to the completion date and we were trying out different hypotheses, uh, and uh, one of the group of tests uh, helped us narrow down what might be happening. So, it's only then we had a clearer idea of what the customer might actually be doing because our tests showed similar patterns in memory usage. So the crash, the crash that we will refer to in the presentation occurs when a number of client session runs select statements that return hundreds and millions of rows. These sessions typically export very large result sets for a SQL query. This pattern is actually uh, common in analytics jobs. This crash happens sporadically, once or twice a day. We also looked up uh, the logs, uh, the crash term in particular, which showed that Beam requests around two gigs of heap memory from the OS. And when this happens, the process crashes out with the out of memory error. Our logs also indicated that the system consumes around 130 gigs of memory within a relatively short period of time. And then logging itself slows down. So that was relevant data we uh, collected from the customer's end and then we had our tests uh, also point in the same direction. So armed with these observations, Matt, would you like to talk about the experiments that happened? Yeah. So after observing these things in the customer's environment, and since we didn't have actual access to the customer's environment, we tried to do a re re uh, in-house reproduction. So we used the same uh, data size and shape, we used the same virtual machine size and the same database configuration, and sadly we weren't able to actually reproduce the true blue crash. And this makes sense because it would seem transient in the customer's environment and it seemed you know, non-deterministic itself. So we thought, what could we reproduce? So we reached for Recon, and for those of you who don't know, it's a very useful debugging tool when it comes to uh, debugging process problems in the Erlang VM. So we used the Recon uh, proc count to find the processes that had the highest amount of memory. And from there, we quickly were able to reproduce the heap issue, right? We were able to see that there were at least two to three of these uh, result conversion processes that had two plus gigabyte heaps at a single time. And then we relied on recon's info function to drill down into these uh, heavy processes and really understand that, yes, they were the data conversion processes. 
And in this reproduction journey, we also relied on a few other tools that Recon provides, such as inspecting schedulers and message queue lengths. So from these experiments, we uh, relied on a few key observations, and you can keep these in the back of your mind as we talk about the improvements that we made. So the first was that it was easy to reproduce, that the result converters accumulated multi-gigabyte heaps. A second observation is that we noticed that the scheduler utilization was lower than we expected. There were a few idle schedulers on these VMs, and we ran on relatively large ones, though, around 16 to 32 cores. A next observation we had was that the SSDs uh, were not being fully utilized. Uh, we were using Azure Premium SSDs, and I believe these would get up to 5,000 IOPS, and we were no getting nowhere near close to that. And finally, we noticed that the process that uh, spills results to disk when they do not fit into memory had relatively low uh, message queues. Uh, and from these observations, we came up with a list of high-level goals. First, we wanted to reduce heap sizes. Next, we wanted to better utilize CPU resources by getting those schedulers active. We wanted to increase disk throughput because we saw that was relatively low. And we generally wanted to move data through the system more efficiently. So we made a series of changes, and we made about six, but we're going to talk about the two most impactful. And the first of those is what we called row-level parallelism. So as you can see in the diagram, uh, we used to use one long-running process for converting each of these data chunks that we fetch from the back-end database, and each data chunk is composed of uh, all the individual rows. And we would serially run down this data chunk and call a conversion function on each of these rows. And since Erlang is an immutable language, it creates many transient new terms instead of modifying them. And our result conversion, in turn, created many transient terms and generated lots of garbage. And we further noticed that heap growth was uh, nonlinear for some data types in our case. For example, you could see here that if we represent a date from the backend database in the Erlang term in the intermediate before translating it to the network protocol of the front end database, this uses quite a few terms itself. And imagine if you had millions of dates flowing through uh, very fast. Further, we noticed that narrow rows have a much larger impact on heap size, right? Like a column, uh, three columns of three integers or dates will have a much higher impact than 100 columns of large text because so many more rows can fit into a single one of these data chunks. So the result conversion process lives for a longer duration with these uh, narrow, uh, narrow row types. Uh, so I'm going to talk about what we did next, and which is we switched to a multi-process converter. So as mentioned previously, a single process would serially iterate all of, all, over all of the rows. And now we divide each data chunk into batches of 100 rows and then convert those in individual processes. And these processes live for a much shorter amount of time and result in much lower heap sizes being accumulated. And the memory is reclaimed by the VM much faster, right? So the garbage collection overhead is much less low. And since scheduler utilization was lower than expected, we realized that work wasn't being spread out across the uh, CPUs as efficiently as possible, right? These data chunks were being clogged up into a single scheduler. So we th this was a benefit of, uh, you know, activating those idle schedulers with the work, which was a, a huge win. And so we're making an obvious trade-off, though, right? We're trading scheduler overhead and the time it takes to spawn a process for long-term heap maintenance. So this works well in our environment, and it was uh, desirable because we had so many resources that we had available to us. So it might not be a good general solution to spawn this many processes at once, but it works quite well in our scenario. The next change I'm going to talk about is called async disk writes. So we're going to start with some observations and constraints. So after introducing these row-level parallel uh, changes, we expected to see some throughput gains, and we didn't really see any. So after the initial crash uh, exploration, we measured many parts of the system, and we relied on the persistent terms and counters in Erlang, which are very lightweight way of measuring aggregate parts of the system. So we instrumented all parts of this conversion process. And we realized that after uh, these through, uh, um, the uh, row-level parallelism changes, that the amount of time it took to send results to uh, the process that spilled um, the data to disk was dominating, and it also matched uh, the amount of time that it took to write to disk. Now, some network protocols are not stream-based. Uh, they require the amount of rows to be sent as a first message, and that's uh, the reason behind us having to buffer these results. So we have to collect all of the results from the backend database, calculate the final number of rows, and then send that as the first message before we can send the results to the client. And if these do not fit into, uh, in memory, then we have to spell them to disk. So um, let's see. So then we switched from asynchronous, or synchronous to asynchronous, right? 
due to these observations of low message queues and the amount of time it took to send the results to this process, we realized that we're using a call instead of cast, right? We're using the synchronous API. So uh, this would block the data converters from fetching more results from the backend database. And this is a general system constraint to prevent unlimited amount of queuing of data, right? So we would um, wait uh, until all of these results were written before it being able to fetch the next data, tra data chunk and then perform that conversion. So we switched to writing asynchronously and we, le uh, we leaned heavily on the intrinsic message delivery properties of the Erlang VM, right? We're able to send messages and they'll be uh, received in the order that we sent them and that they'll always be received, which is very useful because if you have a SQL query with an order by, you expect those results to be turned, returned back by the order key, for example. Uh, further, we had to put uh, in place a back pressure mechanism to make sure that we don't overwhelm the system. So before sending a large chunk of converted results, we first uh, inspect the me uh, message queue length and the heap of the uh, process that writes those disks to make sure that we're not overwhelming the system and then we switch back to synchronous if we need. Finally, we relied on the off heap message queues uh, off heap uh, message queues to prevent overwhelming the heap in a very similar way that we saw on the result converters. And uh, you know this uh, is a bit slower, I believe, that queuing messages off the heap has some overhead, um, but it, the level of protection that provides us is worth it. This resulted in a much higher disk throughput, which also had the effect of speeding up the result conversion process in total, right? Because we're able to fetch results faster and in turn convert them without blocking. One thing we did have to change was our error handling. Previously, let's say if uh, writing results error resulted in like a disk full error, we would return an error tuple with that reason. Uh, and now, uh, instead of synchronously returning results, we rely on process links and just self-terminate the process upon error very pessimistically, which bubbles up to the user and looks the same even though the mechanism behind it is different. So next we're gonna talk about uh, the, what this resulted in. Uh, first and foremost, the crash had stopped in the customer environment and we were able to get them over the edge in time, which was very useful. Uh, further, we measured the amount of throughput that we could write to disk at one time with an extremely large, uh, extremely large load job that was using many of these sessions exporting large amounts of data. And we saw about a 57% increase in throughput, right? So we raised from about 83.5 megabytes to, per second to about 131, which is really nice. And further, we, our memory profile completely changed. The axes are a little skewed here, but you could see that on the left, the memory profile before peaked at about 120 gigabytes and then tapered off. Afterwards, we're at a very steady 20 gigabytes. Uh, so that's a giant improvement in memory and its system health overall. Finally, we're gonna talk about some of the lessons that we learned. First of all, the colloquial wisdom of using short-lived processes holds very true, and in our case, it was quite detrimental to have processes doing large amounts of work for tens of seconds of their life. Uh, and and uh, next up is that the Beams tools for introspection and live debugging are extremely useful, and I'm not sure that we'd be able to identify problems and come up with solutions as fast as we were able to without the use of them. And finally, the sum of uh, the parts of blocking changes might be much greater than each individual part, right? We tested each of these changes individually and their throughput gains were not very high, but when combined, that's when we really saw that, you know, unblocking multiple parts of a blocking process has a huge uh, impact and, and much greater than we thought. Great, thank you very much. Um, do you have any questions? Thanks both of you. There's no questions in the app, so if anyone in the room has any. It looked like there, uh, once the scales were changed and, and with the improvement, it looked like there was a, is there a process leak or something like that? If you go back a couple of slides. Yeah. Oh, that's process memory, and that's the amount that's, uh, of data that's being queued before being written to disk. So the process memory does steadily increase, and it's also increasing in the background as well. So yeah, it's a good question. We, we, we looked into quite a few things. <laughs> the, these are actual graphs from the time we were conducting these investigations. So that investigation was a year ago, but we wanted to give you the real, like, this is what happened last year, and we were deep in the trenches. So, like. Yeah, just wondering, uh, the customer environment, uh, what um, technology stack were they using? Was it also uh, the Beam, Elang, Elixir, or something? Or did you bring in Elixir? Along to solve this problem? 
Yeah, this was originally written in Erlang, and it's mainly Erlang. There's a bit of Elixir code for um, some authentication stuff, but it is all Erlang from the beginning, except the ODBC driver is in uh, C, and it's a port process. But I think the I think nine, more than 90% of the code base is Erlang, mm -hmm. I guess, yeah. In my experience, when I find these sorts of memory issues in my code bases, they tend to show up multiple times in different ways. Is that something that you noticed here? And did you come up with any strategies for detecting these problems or avoiding them from being made again in the future? That's a good question. We've never added a follow-up check for um, making sure heap growth across the system isn't you know, getting crazy. And that's like on the to-do list. We have a few follow-ups from this that you know, we need to get to. But I think that's one for sure is you know, making sure we're, we're monitoring heaps across the system and not just letting them kind of grow. I think we have been approaching that in a sort of indirect way. After this uh, incident, we uh, started doing more, uh, we st strengthened our performance regression suite and we started monitoring it more uh, uh, specifically. Uh, so our regressions uh, be became more strict and we are like, hey, these, these are our SQL tests and let's monitor this uh, with every release and make sure things are healthy but that's a good point, we could get more specific. When you were processing large chunks of data in a single process, you could maintain your order. When you split it out to multiple processes, how did you maintain the order as they could process at different speeds? Good question. We relied on the Lexer's tasks, actually, because you can A, weight them in the order that you spawn them, which was very useful. So it was right at hand because we already integrated Elixir into um, our environment, and that, yeah, that's how. We just spawn a bunch of them and then wait for them all in order. So even if they return in the order, uh, even if some return faster, we still get them, you know, as we spawn them. Good question. Thank you so much, both of you. We are out of time, so uh, let's all head over to the keynote in the next room over, and as you leave, please remember to fill out the survey. Thank you both.